Well, this month, police need your help with a crime in the West Country. Maybe you live there, maybe you travelled there last September. And perhaps without realising it, you were on the same train as a killer or the killer's victim. It was a crime committed in a public place where there must have been hundreds of potential witnesses. The date was the 10th of September last year, a Monday. You could look back in a diary or a calendar to check what you were doing. Our reconstruction starts with what might have been just a bizarre coincidence. It begins on this rail journey. That afternoon, the 318 express train left Cardiff for London Paddington. On board, two buffet stewards were about to start work. Time to open up. Okay. That's him, one with a tash. The chief steward thought that remark was suspicious. The men may have been out to rob the buffet. So later, he asked his colleague to check out the two passengers to see if he recognised them. He didn't, but he remembers one man had a northern accent and both were scruffily dressed. The one on the left was over six foot with a spotty complexion. The other had a moustache, was slim and in his early 20s. We're now approaching Bristol Parkway. The two men got up to leave the train shortly before 10 to 4, as it neared Bristol Parkway. They walked to the rear carriage. Perhaps they knew it was closest to the station exit. All the time they'd been on the train, the two buffet staff, particularly the steward with the moustache, felt they were being watched. Perhaps the reason the two men got off at Parkway was that they'd realised the person they were looking for wasn't on that train. Early evening, the same day, at Paddington Station in London. Another steward, also with a moustache, Mark Yendel, and this stewardess were due to start their last shift of the day. The 7.30 evening train to Temple Meads would take them both back home to Bristol. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the chief steward. The buffet car, situated at the rear of the train, is now open for light refreshments, drinks, toasted sandwiches, etc. Thank you. Regulars on the train might well have recognised Mark Yendel and his assistant. They often work together as a team on the buffet cars on that West Country line. Mark was married with a baby daughter, and he was known for his individual style of working. He rarely wore the full chief steward's uniform, preferring to work simply in an open-necked shirt. And he even acted as waiter to a few regular customers. Right, that's us then. That's cool. Uh, no, I think I'll give it a miss tonight, Debbie. At 10 past nine that evening, Mark Yendel and his assistant had finished work at Bristol Temple Meads. Station staff remember he left by the main exit and walked out to the adjoining car park where he'd left his red Lancia car earlier that day. Now he was only a few minutes away from home, but he was never to see his family again. From forensic evidence, it would seem that Mark was attacked in the car park by at least two men, and that he was then driven away in the back of his own car. Whoever killed him must have had some local knowledge, because the Lancia was taken to Welsh Back, a spot between the Bristol and Redcliffe bridges, and conveniently close to the water's edge. It was two days later, in the early hours of Wednesday the 12th of September, that Mark Yendel's car was discovered by this policeman patrolling Bristol docks.
Blood stains on the car and pavement led him into sheds by the dockside and he followed a trail to the water's edge. Control from 2094. Request back off Welsh back. Vehicle found in suspicious circumstances. Over. This was where Frogman, working in 14 feet of water, recovered the body of Mark Yendel. Mark, pictured here only months before his death, had not been robbed. It was an apparently motiveless killing. Well, Detective Chief Inspector Jeff Butler is leading this investigation. Two stewards with moustaches on two train journeys on the same day. Do you think that's a, a connection or do you think that's coincidence? I think there may well be a connection. Um, both stewards looked remarkably alike. And, of course, the deceased Mark Yendel, prior to working on the Bristol run, used, in fact, to work on the Cardiff run. Could we have your descriptions of the two men that you were hoping to interview again? Yes, firstly, the man on the left was by far the smaller of the two. Um, he had a moustache, a Mexican-style moustache, about five foot six inches tall. He had dark brown hair, which was cut very short. The second man was described as a big man, six feet two, six feet three, Slim build, with hair which was curly on top, and he was wearing a fawn lumber jacket with a dirty white collar. And it's interesting to note, when they got off the train, the man on the left, the smaller of the two men, appeared to be we wearing a burgundy body warmer with a black stripe around the waistband. You need to trace those men, if even if only to eliminate them. Yes, we do. I, I really would like to trace them. Are there any clues from the scene of the murder on that night? Yes, there are. Uh, a witness saw a white Mark IV Cortina with a T suffix. And this vehicle was seen to drive slowly into the car park uh, as though it was looking for somewhere to park. It's a bit confusing between those two cars there. Which yes, car is which? It's, it's the white one, the one on the right. Um, it drove slowly in the, into the car park, followed by the witness's car. And the witness thought that the car was looking for somewhere to park. He followed the car slowly into the car park, and then the car stopped just past the entrance to the part of the car park where the deceased was murdered. He then noticed that a man had come and started speaking to the driver of the Ford Cortina, and that man is described as very heavily built, wearing a white shirt with the sleeves rolled up, and we'd like to trace him. It's very hard to believe that no one saw anything in a busy station car park like that at 10 past nine in the evening. Yes, it is rather strange. It's a very busy place, Temple Meads, especially at that time of night. The car itself that the deceased was driven away in is a red, for, is a red Lancia, which uh, is not that common a car. And of course, when it left Temple Meads, it drove down to Welsh Back, which is also another very busy area of the city, surrounded by pubs and clubs. Mr Butler, thank you very much indeed. And the number to ring in absolute confidence, if you can help in any way, is 01-811-8055, 01-811-8055. Or you can call the Trinity Road Incident Room in Bristol, and that is Bristol 267-985, Bristol 0272-267-985. Now the first of tonight's reconstructions. It's the most controversial murder hunt in Britain. It's a case that's repeatedly made headlines and about which questions have been raised in Parliament. The murder of Hilda Murrell. Miss Murrell was 79. She lived in Shropshire and she was a rose grower of international fame. There have been suggestions that MI5 was involved in her murder, that she was under surveillance because she was an active opponent of nuclear power or because during the Falklands War her nephew had been a naval intelligence officer at the time the battleship General Belgrano was sunk. Well, the police say the evidence points in quite another way. They're increasingly convinced the murder was a common burglary that went wrong. What you're about to see is based on the detective's files and therefore on the police interpretation of events. You're going to see evidence that's never been shown before. It's almost exactly 12 months since the crime. The date, remember, Wednesday, the 21st of March. Just before noon that day, friends remember seeing Hilda Murrell in the Abbey Foregate area of Shrewsbury. She'd been shopping at Safeways and drawn some money from a nearby bank when she was seen getting into her white Renault car. 
had only half a mile to go to the detached house in Sutton Road, where she lived alone. That lunchtime, however, someone may have got there before her. From what was later found at the scene of the crime, police know she put some of her shopping away. They also know that at some stage she must have gone upstairs. Hilda Murrell was apparently attacked inside the house and tied up while the intruder carried out a search. From the kitchen, one of her knives was probably taken, and though the burglar searched her handbag, he ignored a check card and checkbook, concentrating on the cash she'd taken from the bank that morning. The living room curtains were drawn, and as her attacker continued his search, he helped himself to a drink. Even at this stage in the escalating violence, her attacker may not have wanted to kill her. And in one of the strangest twists of the story, he forced her out of the house and into her own car. From her house in Sutton Road, the first landmark the car passed was a roundabout known locally as Column Island. It seemed to be heading straight for the centre of town. It was then seen close to the Monkmore Road traffic lights. Hilda Murrell was slumped in the passenger seat and the car took a right turn away from the town centre. A couple of minutes later, at the far end of Monkmore Road, it passed Shrewsbury Police Station and half a mile further on, it was heading out into the Shropshire countryside. It crossed Heathgate's roundabout and took the final exit, travelling east. A couple driving towards town remember a white car swerving past them as it sped out into the countryside. The car was following a back route to Newport until it turned off into a country road called Hunkington Lane. It was about this point, along that narrow country lane, that police believe Hilda Murrell, already bruised and battered, began to come round. Sit still. Sit still. You'll get some of that. Some of that. Right. Hello. Hello. Get him. We know from the tyre tracks that it was here that the car skidded off the road, and it's likely that Hilda Murrell was then forced to get out. Get out! <laughs> Her attacker then began a frantic attempt to get the car moving again, shoving a book under the front wheel. It could have been at this point that she took the car's ignition keys. They were later found in her pocket. And despite her age and appalling injuries, Hilda Murrell may have made one last attempt to get away. Oi! Oi! Come here! Come here! Whatever happened, police believe that her attacker bundled Hilda Murrell off that country lane and into a field. evidence found there seems to suggest she was stabbed and beaten as she was forced across the field and dragged towards a small coppice 
where she would die some hours later. Three days later, Hilda Murrell's body was discovered a quarter of a mile away from her abandoned car. Now, in that reconstruction, we were as accurate as we could be. We used Hilda Murrell's own car and, where possible, her own possessions. Her home, though, in Sutton Road has been sold and it's been changed inside since. So we used instead a neighbour's house. We do, though, have a picture of the real house taken when the crime was first discovered. The detective leading the inquiry, Detective Chief Superintendent David Cole, is going to take us through the scene of crime video taken by the police inside Hilda Marl's home on the weekend that her body was found. Now, first of all, you have pictures of the breakfast room. Yes, the first shots we're going to see are of the breakfast room, and these quite clearly indicate a search of drawers and cupboards. Um, and we move on now to the table in the breakfast room, showing that her handbag and her purse had been searched, and we know that a quantity of money was taken out of the purse. Now, no sign there, particularly of documents being rifled? No. Um, there were various documents within the house to do with uh, her research into the Sizewell B project, and it would appear that none of them were disturbed. It was, though, said that the telephone had been tampered with, that the phone had been carefully disconnected. Yes, it was. There's been a lot of speculation about the telephone, and the next shot, I think, shows quite clearly the telephone as we found it and indicates that it had been ripped out, the wires had been ripped out of the junction box and be had been ripped away from the wall. All the wires had been ripped out of the junction box, as you can plainly see in that shot. Had anybody made any sophisticated attempt to, to bug the phone, as far as you could tell, to, to none tamper with it? None whatsoever, and that has been confirmed by GPO engineers. Right. Now, we know that she went upstairs and that he went upstairs. What yes. did you find when you went to the top of the house? Well, there was a lot of activity upstairs, quite obviously. Uh, the next police video shot uh, shows you the stairway going up the stairway. And at the top, there is a broken balustrade. And uh, we believe that Miss Morrill may have been tied to that balustrade uh, while the intruder was searching other parts of the house. There's the missing balustrade. That's what right. happened to her then? Well, she was then apparently taken into a bedroom. And we've got a still shot of the bedroom. Um, we know that there was some violence in that bedroom and also sexual activity because of human semen that was found on an article in the bedroom and also uh, similar uh, material found on an item of her clothing. Miss Morrill was 79 years old. Yes, uh, this is a particularly disturbing feature of this uh, assault. Now, that doesn't make it sound as though it was an ordinary motive of, of going for papers, yet there have been some peculiar things uh, <coughs> going on, or so it seems. For example, her document she was writing to oppose the Sizewell B power station, the final draft is said to have been missing. Well, that isn't so. I have in front of me uh, the final draft that she was working on, and we've been able to check that by examining her diary. And her diary for the evening before her death quite sh clearly shows that this is the paper that she was uh, working on that particular evening. Do you have any other clues as to who did it? Well, we have, yes, we have a number of people who saw a man in the, um, in the car and we recovered certain items from the car. I've got a couple of them here. We have a Hamlet cigar wrapper, which was found in Miss Morrill's car. She was non a non-smoker, she was anti-smoking. It's unlikely that it belonged to anyone connected with her. And I also have a snare peg, which was found in the glove compartment of the car, which Looks appears like to be... To me. Well, it could be a tent peg, it could be a gamekeeper's or poacher snare. Right. Now, as you say, she was seen in the car with a driver. What description right. do you have of the driver? Well, he's a white male. He's uh, probably in his middle to late 30s. Uh, he's average to thick set. He's got medium brown hair. It's neatly cut. He's got a fringe. And he was wearing the anorak that you see on the picture there, and we believe it's got a D-ring in the centre of the back. Um, we also have a further description of a man who was seen running away later from the scene of the attack. Now, what do we know about, uh, about this well, man? During the afternoon, a number of people saw a man uh, running away from the scene where Miss Morrill had been left. He was wearing ordinary grey clothing. He was wearing training shoes. He didn't appear to be particularly fit. He was running towards Shrewsbury Town Centre. To, uh, we lost him. Uh, we, the last sighting we have of him is a place called Heathgates Island on the outskirts of Shrewsbury. Now, it seems that he didn't 
come by car to the house, otherwise he presumably would have gone away in his own car. That's um, a distinct possibility. How, how did he get there and how did he get away? Well, we're particularly interested in anyone who may have pitch, uh, picked up a, a hitchhiker that particular morning and dropped him off at Shrewsbury. It's a very busy through route on the main A5 road. Her house was close by and we're also interested in how he got away and he may well have been picked up by a vehicle as a hitchhiker and taken away from Shrewsbury. Any idea why he took Miss Murrell with him? I mean, clearly well, no. he uh, wasn't intending to head for those woods, the car went off the road by mistake. I'm afraid that's a mystery. Until we find him, we won't know. Well, let's hope you do find him, Mr Cole, thank you. Um, if you think that you can help West Mercia Police in any way, here's the number. It's 01811 8055, 01811 8055. As I say, you can talk to detectives on the case or to a BBC researcher. You can call West Mercia Police Direct if you want. They're in Shrewsbury on 52617. That's 0743 for Shrewsbury, 52617. Our next case takes us to Wastwater in Cumbria, where, if you remember, police frogmen found the so-called so Lady in the Lake, a body whose discovery led last week to the imprisonment for manslaughter of the airline pilot Peter Hogg. Ironically, it was a quite different lady that had caused the police to search Wastwater. They'd been hunting for this young woman, Veron Veronique Marr. Veronique was 21. She came over here from her home just outside Paris to improve her English and in the long, hot summer of 1983, she disappeared. Now in a unique cross-channel appeal, Crime Watch UK is linking with a French television programme called Au Nom de l'Amour. Veronique's parents here make a direct appeal to the French public. And in one of her vacations, Veronique came to England and the Lake District. We hope the reconstruction you're about to see will jog your memory. Remember, it's July 1983. Veronique Marr was a student of agriculture and loved the countryside. When she came to England, the Lake District in Cumbria was perhaps an obvious place for her to visit. She arrived at the lakes by train on Sunday the 24th of July, two years ago. She spent a week walking, exploring the fells by day and staying at youth hostels overnight. It seems to have been a solitary holiday. Her English was poor and she would have met few hikers who could speak French. By Saturday evening, the 30th of July, she'd reached Wasdell Hall Youth Hostel. No one paid particular attention to her. She was another youth hosteler on holiday. Next morning, Veronique spoke to a Danish woman she'd met at the hostel. Their conversation gives the only clue to the mystery of Veronique's disappearance. Are you ready for your cup Yes, I am. And you for money? Yes, me too. Thank you. Fais-tu de la marche encore aujourd'hui? Ah oui, je vais monter jusqu'à Scarfell Peak. C'est le monde le plus haut d'Angleterre, mais il ne fait que 1000 mètres. After breakfast and her cleaning duty, Veronique checked out of Wasdell Hall Youth Hostel. Veronique, Veronique Ma. Yes. There you are, love. Thank you. Bye-bye. At nine o'clock that Sunday morning, Veronique walked out of the hostel and vanished. As far as the police know, she's never been seen again. Wastel Hall is on the shores of Lake Wastwater. It's one of the wildest parts of England, set in the roughest of mountain country. Veronique could have taken one of three routes from the hostel. She might have gone down the valley towards Nether Wasdell and Stanton Bridge, but remember she'd said she was going into the hills to climb Scorfell Pike. One route to it is by road to the head of the lake. Perhaps someone passed her. Were you walking in the valley that July Sunday morning? The other route is along the scree slopes that run down to the lake. Perhaps Veronique lost her footing. The scree is very loose and treacherous, and sometimes landslides cover the path. 
Veronique was carrying a heavy rucksack, and if she fell, it's feared she might have drowned. This is why police have spent hours in underwater searching. Divers from the Lancashire underwater team have searched the lake on four separate occasions. Roped together for a necklace search, they've examined the perimeter of the lake bed in minute detail, but have found nothing belonging to Veronique. The police also called on the Wasdall Mountain Rescue Team and volunteers from the local Outward Bound School. Between them, they've searched hundreds of acres of moorland. And police dogs have been on the mountainside too, combing the woodland and gullies. RAF helicopter pilots on regular training missions have been alerted to look out for anything unusual on the fells. But there's still no sign of Veronique. Ironically, during the hunt for Veronique, the police found something else. The body of Mrs. Margaret Hogg. Her husband, an airline pilot, had dumped her from a small dinghy seven and a half years before. Her body had been trussed in a parcel, weighted with a curbstone, and dropped by chance in one of the shallower parts of the lake. Last week, her husband was jailed for four years. Wastwater is the deepest lake in England. In places, it drops to over 300 feet, well beyond the range of normal diving. Two weeks ago, the police diving team returned to Wastwater to experiment with new equipment. Crime Watch helped the police by negotiating the use of an American mini submarine, the first of its kind in Britain, and we were there to film the experiment. The submarine's television camera gave the police an eye on the bottom of the lake. But Wastwater is over three miles long and half a mile wide. A day's trial is not enough. A long and methodical search would be needed to cover the whole of the lake bed. Veronique's family are desperate for news, one way or the other. Their last contact with Veronique was this postcard, which she sent her grandparents a few days before she disappeared. It's the family's memento of the young woman who only came to Britain to improve her English. Well, in charge of the case is Chief Inspector Steve Reed of the Cumbrian Police. First of all, let's look at the route that Veronique took on her holiday there. She'd arrived at Windermere by train on the evening of Sunday, the 24th of July. She stayed at Ambleside Youth Hostel nearby. From there, she travelled north and climbed one of the Lake District's peaks, Helvellyn. That night, Monday, she stayed at a guest house on Lake Thirlmere. Where she went next isn't known, and that's one of your points of appeal, in fact, isn't it, on that Tuesday? Yes, it is. Although it's not vital to the inquiry, we knew everywhere that Veronica could stay that week, apart from the night of Tuesday the 26th. Uh, we believe it was in the Keswick Borrowdale area. If anyone knew the exact whereabouts, obviously we'll be delighted to hear from them. Right, and the next positive sighting then was on Wednesday, when Veronique stayed at Longthwaite Hostel in Borrowdale. On the next two nights, she stayed in hostels at Lake Buttermere and Lake Ennerdale. From there, she made her way south and stayed at the hostel by Lake Wastwater on Saturday night, the 30th of July. But the question is, where was she going then? Remember, she left Wasdall Hall on Sunday morning, the 31st of July. She'd made a booking for Monday, the 1st of August at Coniston. But what about Sunday night? She might have been heading for a hostel between the two. There was one at Cockley Beck, but that one was closed. Chief Inspector Reid, where do you think Veronique was heading, in fact? Well, as you say, the, her intention was to stay at Coniston the night after and to walk Scarfell Pikes that day. It could well be that she would choose to go via Grasmere, 
which is a, a popular staying place for someone on a, on a walking holiday, such as Veronique was having in the Lake District at that time. What are your theories about exactly what happened to her? Well, there are, there are two options, really. Uh, what one is that Veronique is alive, but one has to be realistic and think that that is a remote possibility, because when she went missing, we know that she's in possession of a certain number of travellers' checks, and we know to this date they have not been cashed. The other option, of course, is that she's dead, which could be as a result of a fatal accident on the fells, or she could have been murdered, but there's certainly no evidence to substantiate that whatsoever. Would she have had any reason, do you know, that to want to disappear without trace? None whatsoever, no. Um, all our inquiries, I just believe that she was a, shall we say, a homely girl. We've seen from a family, obviously, that, that it is a close family, so what do you think somebody might be able to help you with tonight? What sort of calls are you hoping for? Well, what we would ask for is that anyone that saw Veronique after that morning she left the youth hostel on the 31st of July to contact us if they saw her that day or any knowledge of her whereabouts thereafter to contact us. And also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that she could have suffered a, a fatal accident on the fells. Then after this period of time, all that would remain would be the rucksack and possibly a clothing. And I have an identical type of rucksack that Veronique was wearing on the day in question. And again, one would ask that if anyone has seen such an abandoned rucksack on the fells or abandoned elsewhere, uh, to contact us. Either last year or indeed the coming year in the holiday C period. Certainly. And those dates again, Tuesday the 26th of July and Sunday the 31st. We, if anybody saw her then, please let us know. The number to call if you think you can help is 01 811 8055. 01 811 8055. Or you can call Cumbria Police Direct at the incident room in Penrith. That is 0768 66 Penrith 66 Now, lastly this evening, we go to North East Scotland. We want to take you back six months to a remote part of the country, and maybe you know somebody who's been there. On Monday, September the 24th, last year, the small village of Kalboki was shocked by a murder. The victim was Elizabeth Sutherland, a popular woman in the village and the mother of two children. Her home, Kalboki, is on the Black Isle, just north of Inverness. The Black Isle is a peninsula on the south side of the Cromarty Firth. The village of Kulboki, with a population of about 300, overlooks the Firth. This is where Elizabeth Sutherland lived. This is the family home, Dunrobin. It's on the outskirts of Kulboki, on the road towards the next village, Munlochy. Only five feet tall, Elizabeth was also known as Totsy. Her husband, Kenny, is a builder, and they have a son, Stephen. On the morning of Monday, September the 24th, Totsy dropped off her other child, Jane, at the village school. Right, Cheerio. See you later. Watch yourself. Yeah, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Her next stop was to pick up the morning paper. Morning, Alice. Morning, Tots. Thank you. Thank you. Cheerio. Cheerio. By 12 o'clock, after calling at her parents' house, Totsy was home and finishing off the housework. Then, about 12.30, she walked the 50 yards down to her parents' house to see her sister. See those barrels we bought. Uh huh. What's see the if they fit in the pots. Really? On mine are fine. Yes. Totsy was always active in village life. That day, she and her sister Jane were planning for the local bulb show. We're on fine with mine. I think we might win something there. Oh, I think Lovely. so. I think mm -hmm. we've a good chance at this mm -hmm. year. Definitely. Uh huh. I was thinking of planting some in the garden. You know, really? this afternoon. Uh huh. Oh, well, that would make a nice display for the spring, wouldn't mm -hmm. it? At about the same time, a mile away, this lorry driver finished his brake and set off up the Mount Eagle Road. The road goes by the Mount Eagle transmitter in the direction of Kulboki. A mile further on, he'd passed the Sutherland's house. As the lorry drove along the single track road, a red Cavalier car tried to get past.
the driver remembered that the registration number ended with a T. Totsie left her sister after chatting for no more than 10 minutes. Meanwhile, the lorry driver noticed the red Cavalier again. It was now parked, with the driver apparently gone, and less than a quarter of a mile from Dunrobin. The lorry driver saw Totsy as he passed the house. The time, according to his tachograph, was 12.38. This was the last time she was definitely seen alive. Strangers and strange cars stand out in a small community like Kalboki, and several incidents were noticed that day. At one o'clock, this cyclist was seen heading into Kalboki village. He had a hat and a fawn coat. The police have never been able to trace him. At 1.35, a man was seen on the Dunkerston Road walking towards the village. He, too, has never been traced. And then between two and four, another cavalier, this time a white one, was seen by two different witnesses parked here only a few yards from the house. At about four o'clock, Jane Sutherland came home from school. Some time in the previous three and a half hours, her mother had been stabbed to death in the house. Her nine-year-old daughter discovered the body. Superintendent Andrew Lister, how's the family now? The family are remarkably good. Uh, the little girl, who's a very bright girl, is a bit disturbed, upset, but overall they are remarkably good. Have you any idea of the motive? Uh, not, no clear idea. There, are, there is uh, indications of it being theft, but then nothing was stolen. So I've got this honestly say there's no clear motive. Well, let's take a look at the cl clues. We have a map here. Now, let's remind ourselves of the sightings. Uh, Dunrobin, there it is, on the east side of Kalboki. The red car was seen here, about four or 500 yards from the home. The white car was seen here, very close to the house. Now, you need to find the drivers. That is correct. We are, the, the two vehicles being so close to the locus at the material time on that date, it's of utmost, utmost importance that we do identify the drivers and the owners of the cars so that we can eliminate them, eliminate them from the inquiry. It's a red Cavalier and a white Cavalier, and it's Monday, September the 24th, last year. No, I see correctly. Now, there was also the cyclist um, on the road from uh, Cromarty, wasn't it, just outside uh, Kalboki? That is correct. The cyclist is in the same category as the cars, despite the uh, very extensive inquiries, we have been unable to face them. And a pedestrian on the road to uh, Kalboki, on the Dunkerston Road, I think. Again, that is exactly the same, yes. Now, do you have any other clues at all? Yes, we have one person, a male person, who walked into the filling station at Conan Bridge, it's known as Conan Bridge Filling Station, about 9.30 p.m. on the evening of the murder. He was carrying a gallon oil can, which he had filled with petrol, purchased 20 regal cigarettes, and left. He was, not, he was heard to speak and had an English accent. So he's English and he smokes regal cigarettes. Any other information? I mean, presumably it's possible that it wasn't an outsider at all. Is there anything you want the residents of Kalboki to look out for or report? Oh, yes, very much so. I would ask the people in Kalboki to think hard about what happened prior to the murder, what happened on the day of the murder, what they saw, what they heard. And what they have seen and heard since, it may be of importance to this case. We need their help, very much so the local people. And I would ask all viewers to think hard, if they can give us anything at all that may help us in this case, and we certainly need it, then I'd ask them to ring in now and do so, and it would be treated in confidence. All right, thank you very much, Superintendent Lister.
The number, as always, if you're going to ring here in London, 01 811 8055, 01 811 8055. Or you can call Northern Constabulary Direct. Here's the number, Dingwall 62444. That's 0349 for Dingwall, 62444. Now to the first of this month's reconstructions. A few weeks ago, we received a tragic and very moving letter from Robert and Lee Goebel in Hastings. They were desperate to find whoever set fire to their home three months ago while they and their children were asleep inside. At the same time, Sussex police asked us for help. In the reconstruction you're about to see, many people, including neighbors who were there that Saturday night, have taken part, actors and actresses, play the Goebel family. The house is 38 St. Helens Road, which is a main thoroughfare in Hastings. Our reconstruction begins in the early hours of Sunday, February the 3rd. Sammy, Sammy, come on. Come, Sammy. Sammy, come, come. come on. Finished. Right. What time are we going to your mum's tomorrow, love? Oh, I said about lunchtime. I must look in on the kids. Lee Goble kissed the children goodnight as usual before she and her husband went to bed. It was about 1.30. Just over an hour later, a taxi drove up St Helens Road. The driver recalled seeing two men with an oil drum beside a van parked near the Goebbels' house. He assumed they'd run out of petrol. Passing driver remembers a man dashing across the road into the park opposite number 38. Screams, Bob Spice, a builder who lives next door, rushed out to help. Another neighbour phoned the fire brigade. As Bob got a ladder up to the parents, he realised the children were still trapped in the back bedroom. He tried desperately to reach them. Another neighbour, Ron Salt, realised he'd have to climb the ladder to try and persuade the parents to come down. He'd already noticed a young man simply standing and watching. He was holding a white crash helmet.
As the ambulance left, the police already knew that the fire had been started deliberately. The two children never recovered. The arson attack had now become a murder inquiry. And Detective Superintendent Bill Clements is in charge of the case. Do you think murder was the intention? Well, I think that they meant harm to the Goble family because by pouring the petrol on the stairs, they cut off their way of escape, so they meant to harm them, yes. Have you found any possible grudge against the family? No, um, they're a very happy family. We've seen all their friends and relatives. Um, nobody has any grudge against the Goebbels, and certainly they couldn't have had anything against those two little children. So no apparent motive at the moment. You found that oil can in the garden. Do you think that's significant? Yes. Um, at some time it's contained petrol. It doesn't belong to any of the Goebbels, and it doesn't belong to any of their near neighbours. Um, but it's certainly contained petrol. What's rather surprising is that it was a main road and yet not many witnesses have come forward. That's true. In fact, we've got over 30 people that have been described by various witnesses who we've still yet to trace. There are a lot of people still outstanding. Now, a number of people you particularly want to get hold of, um, the two men who were seen beside that van. That's right. They were seen some time earlier than in that evening um, at that one of the men was in his mid-thirties with a sallow complexion and wearing a bomber jacket. They're, they need to be eliminated from the inquiry. And the van's quite unusual. Yes, it's exactly as shown. Um, it's a BMC model, except that at the rear there are windows in the doors. It's a model that hasn't been manufactured since 1972. And do you know what colour it was, the van? Um, no, the taxi man who saw it can only say it's red. Uh, dark, sorry. A dark colour, right. And mm. you also want to know who that man was on the screen there who was running across the road? Yes, he was seen just before the fire was discovered. He's most important. He's a young man in his early 20s in a sort of motorcycle jacket, probably leather. He's most important for us to find. That was about quarter to four. Yes. And interesting he had a leather jacket because the young man who was seen just gazing at the blaze also had a leather jacket. That's right, and he, uh, the white, man with the white crash helmet was at the scene when the fire was discovered. He, um, he could be the same man uh, as previously shown, but of course they were described by different witnesses. So we need to find those. Most important those men are. Anyone else you particularly want to find out who you know was there? Yes. Um, there's a young lady who was walking her dog. Um, she was seen within 100 yards of the scene just about the time of the fire. Um, it's most unusual for anybody to be walking a dog that time of night, um, and we would have liked for her to have come forward. Right, so to sum up, exactly what do you want people to come forward with tonight? Um, we want anybody who didn't have relatives in their house who fear they might know the identity of the person responsible um, and even if it means informing on someone they know it's most important that they come forward. Detective Superintendent, thank you. And if you think you can help, please do ring us. You can talk to the detectives or if you prefer you can talk to a BBC researcher. The number 01 811 8055. The lines are open, but if you can't get through, keep trying. Or you could call Sussex Police in Hastings. The number 425 treble O. That's 0424, the code for Hastings, 425 treble O. Our next story is a mystery about two women who simply vanished. They lived near each other in a picturesque part of North Wales and they were last seen in the same vicinity. And yet they went missing two years apart. First of all, Mrs Peggy Goodman. She lived alone and though she was 81 years old, she was far more energetic than many people 20 years younger. She frequently went hiking, attended demonstrations for CND and sometimes went away from home without telling anyone. She was last seen near her home six days before Christmas in December 1982. And then on January the 4th this year, a second woman went missing from just down the road. Our reconstruction is in English, though the community usually speaks Welsh. The place is a village set beside the River Dee called Corwin. It's a few miles from the tourist centre of Clangochlan and on the N A5. On the 4th of January this year, Mrs. Mavanwy Jones disappeared without trace, just half a mile from where Mrs. Goodman was last seen. Mavanwy has been a popular and well-known figure in the small community of Corwen. Happily married with a 20-year-old son, the family have lived in the town for over 21 years. 
One Friday afternoon, four months ago, Mavanwi was visiting a friend in nearby Cloud Ponkin. Well, we don't go very far from Corwin. We yes. just drink and drive. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I think it'll be a lot of fun. I'm very grateful to you for helping me. Oh, it's no trouble. Yes. No trouble. I'll be off now. Right? Right. And I'll definitely see you. Yes, Monday. Remember, remember to call. Yes, I will. Have a nice time tonight. Oh, yes. Unaware that she'd missed the bus, Mavanwi left for home. She was looking forward to going out to dinner that evening with her husband and friends, and she wanted to be home early to get ready. The time was 4.20 in the afternoon of Friday, the 4th of January this year. Mrs. Griffiths, I've missed the bus. I'm going to walk. Nine times out of ten, I will get a lift. Cheerio. Ta-da. This woman is the first of several witnesses who were to see Mifanwe as she started to walk the one and a half miles home. Hello, a few minutes later, she was seen by these two men who lived nearby. As she continued to walk, a witness driving towards her spotted her and opposite, a man standing by a blue Vauxhall Viva. This man has never been identified. There were several sightings of Mifanwe as she passed the small housing estate at Meisewachen. But it was the driver of this red car who was the last person we know to see Mifanwe Jones. She'd now walked half a mile. What happened to her next is a mystery. Five minutes later, further down the road, a passing motorist found this deer stalker hat. It wasn't Mifanwe's, and no one has yet claimed it. A couple were later seen arguing on this bridge shortly after Mifanwe vanished, and on the same route that she would have taken home. So what did happen? Police need your help with the following. They need to identify the man standing beside this light blue Vauxhall Viva, who appeared to be watching Mifanwe as she walked past. This was the last sighting of Mifanwe by the driver of the red car, what happened next? Did she accept a lift? If so, since she never got home, was she driven away from Corwin down here to the right or straight on to Carrig Lane? It was here that the deer stalker hat was found. Is it yours or do you know who it belongs to? It's possible Mavanwi may have taken a short cut through this farm. She would have rejoined the main road here where the couple were seen arguing. Police need to trace this couple. Faced with severe weather conditions which hampered their searches, teams of police frogmen were sent in to sweep a 16-mile stretch of the River Dee. Air and ground searches were made over difficult terrain. And villagers joined the police in scouring the countryside. But so far, nothing has been found. Police are certain Mifanwe Jones would not, of her own choice, have left the home and family she loved, and they now fear for her safety. Her husband, Emir, and son, Keith, wait anxiously for news. Well, the hardest part of it has been the, the waiting and the not knowing what has really happened. It's been a great burden, really, to think of one day after the other and nothing, no answer coming to the problem at all. If anybody has got any information, however small, if they would kindly come forward and either report it to the 
either to the BBC or to the police locally or anywhere in North Wales, I'd be more than grateful. Well, the detective looking for Mifanwy Jones and indeed for Peggy Goodman is Chief Inspector John Cook. Do you actually link the two? Do you think that uh, the two women went missing for similar reasons? No, we don't. From the inquiries we've conducted both into Mrs Goodman's background and Mrs Jones's background, we don't feel that they are connected. Looking at the Mifanwy Jones disappearance, just remind ourselves of, of the geography. Um, Corwin, of course, not far from Flying Gotland. Let's take a closer look at that. And we can see the bungalow, her friend's bungalow, which she left at 4.20, wasn't it? 4.20, that's correct. And yeah. she was seen by the woman at the bus stop walking down to where the Vauxhall Viva was. And that's the man by the blue Viva. Uh, what description do we have of him? He's described by uh, our witness as being um, um, a middle-aged man, approximately 45 years of age, medium build, with dark coral-length hair, sideburns, and wearing what we believe to be a sheepskin coat. He might, of course, have absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance. Oh, absolutely. He, he, it's, a, it's a matter, really, of eliminating from our quarries, tracing him and eliminating him. OK. She then walks further down the road towards Corwin, and I think the last sighting of her was about 4.35. We said that was the red car going the other direction, wasn't That's it? That's correct, yes. And then she... Well, we don't know what happened then. The hat was found here just after the junction down to Corwin. Now, you've brought that hat with you. Yes, I have. It's... Um, a deerstalker hat, well used, well worn, but in good condition. As, as you can see, it's a herringbone, herringbone pattern. On the inside label, it has the name Palatine. Uh, and we're very anxious to trace the owner of this hat because he, just like the driver of the Vauxhall Viva, would have been at the scene at the time Mrs. Jones was last seen. Right, and they might have seen something, or they might have been a witness, even though they don't, they don't recognise it. That's correct, yes. Or, OK. Now, then there was the couple on the bridge, of course. They were seen to be arguing. Um, what do we know about that couple? All we know is that they were in the possession of a dark, small-type van, that they were a middle-aged couple again, that the female was wearing clothing, light clothing. Um, was she my family? It, it's possible, but it's going to be doubtful, bearing in mind that that incident was approximately 25 minutes after Mrs Jones's last sighting. Very briefly, is there any other appeal that you'd like to make to viewers in this case? Yes, I would. I would like to uh, anybody who saw Mrs Jones that afternoon to come forward and to contact us this evening. All right, John Cook, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. If you can help, uh, the number, 811-8055, as always, 811-8055, or you can ring North Wales Police Direct. Here's their number at Wrexham, 353111. That's 0978 for Wrexham. Three, five, three, triple one. It was about this time last year that the papers were headlining the disappearance of seven-year-old Mark Tilsley from Wokingham. Despite a huge police inquiry, there's still no trace of Mark. It's a long shot, perhaps, hoping for new witnesses a year on. After all, hundreds of people have already tried to help. But Thames Valley Police have asked us to use the anniversary, which was two weeks ago now, to film a reconstruction and see if we could still jog a memory and provide a new and vital clue. Mark's home is in Wokingham, ten miles from Reading in Berkshire. The fair was back in Wokingham this weekend, on the same ground at Wellington Road, where it's been each May or June for 50 years. Mark's home, too, was in the centre of Wokingham. The fair was a five-minute bike ride away. It's 50 miles away on Friday, the 1st of June last year, at 7.20 in the morning. A lorry stops for a hitchhiker on the A30. Going to Wokingham? Yeah. <laughs> the driver, Shane Northway, picked up his passenger 20 miles east of Salisbury, just outside Stockbridge. He remembers the man well. He had a bit, there was a little bit of odour there, and you could see him been sleeping rough. He had, there was dirt all around the collar of his shirt. His Mac was really filthy on the inside, red lining. Where you going, mate? I'm making my way around the country looking for work. He was in the cab with me for about two and three quarter hours, and I eventually dropped him off just past the fairground in Wokenham. You can drop me off here, mate, if you like. It'll do me. I'll just pull down the road out of the way of the traffic. All right. 
When the man got out, he headed back up Wellington Road towards the fairground. It was a busy time on the main road, and someone must have seen him. Bye-bye, Mark. See you later. Mark's mother left home at 5.15 that evening to go to work. She hasn't seen Mark since. Bye. Mark left the house half an hour later, telling his father he was going to the fair. He was a quiet, shy boy, often to be seen on his bike in the town centre. The tiger jacket he wore that day was eye-catching and distinctive. Eyewitness accounts confirm that Mark was at the fair by 6.30 that evening. Two witnesses recall that a man appeared to be watching Mark. Police are also certain that an hour and a quarter later, Mark was still at the fair, now on the Dodgems. It's possible that the man who was with him was the same man who earlier had been watching him. He was about six feet tall, with scruffy hair, very similar to the man dropped off earlier in the day by the lorry driver. Except this man had glasses. About 8 p.m., Mark leaves the fairground with the same man. Though he left his bike behind, Mark appears to have left the fair quite willingly. Correct for two points. Challenge or tell me yourself. It was this man, David Hine, who may have been the last person to see Mark Tildesley that Friday evening. If it was Mark, he was in Langborough Road, apparently with the same man he'd been with at the fair. Mark has never been seen again. His mother still refuses to believe the worst. I still say someone's got him and he's le they're living in rough or something because it's a mother's instinct. I know he's all right. Well, we still hope so. Detective Superintendent Tony Miller is now in charge of this investigation. Now, how likely is it that the hitchhiker, the man there at the fair, and the man we've just seen in Langborough Road are one and the same man, in fact? Quite frankly, we can't say positively. What I can say is that I'm fairly sure that the man seen at the fair and the man in Langborough Road are one and the same. You will recall the description given of the man who had the lift by the lorry driver. It's not dissimilar to the man at the fairground. In fact, he was about 45 to 60 years of age. He had grey hair, browning, and indeed he was described as having a long nose. This was a feature about him, and also a beard growth, which indeed matched the man who was given the lift. Now, the man seen at the fair had spectacles on. So if we look at our video Indeed. fit, we can see what he might look like with glasses on. Right. Now, the hitchhiker in the lorry wasn't wearing any glasses, was he? Indeed he wasn't, and indeed the man in Langborough Road wasn't. But other than that, the descriptions are very, very similar. So what you want to do is for the man who was hitchhiking that ride in the lorry that day to at least come forward so that you can eliminate him? Indeed we would, yes. Well, if we can recap on his movements that day, the lorry driver picked up the hitchhiker on Friday the 1st of June, and that was just west of Stockbridge, and at 7.20 in the morning. They then travelled up the A30 and along the M3 and reached Wokingham at about 10 to 10, again that morning, and the driver dropped him off in Wellington Road near to the fair. Now, do we know where he went after that? We don't, but perhaps we could start by going back to the commencement of that journey, and you will recall that he had a tachograph in his hand. We can see it there. And as the viewers can see. The reason I take you back there is because, indeed, this man may have been a lorry driver. If he was, uh, other persons may have given him a lift from Wokingham, if, in fact, they did, we'd like them to come forward. We should say that anybody who hitches the lift with one of the tachograph is saying to a lorry driver that, that he's another lorry driver. Indeed, that it. gives the indication, yes. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a conversation by this man with the lorry driver to the effect he was looking for casual labour fruit picking. I'd like to hear from anyone who gave employment of that nature to a man of that description.
So somebody might remember picking up somebody with a tachograph, because that was quite distinct. Indeed they might. Uh, as we've emphasised, we, if nothing else, we want to eliminate this man from the inquiry. Right. Now, you've traced so far about 400 people who were actually at the fair on that day. How many more people do you think you need to see? How many more people were there? I can't answer how many people were there, but what I can say is I want to speak to every person who went at the fair that evening. Indeed, uh, let us be the judge of what they saw uh, as to whether it's of evidential value. Please come forward and contact us. And just once again, we've seen the jacket in the film. Let's have one more look at it. You've brought it a facsimile of the jacket in with the tiger motif. Indeed. That's uh, the jacket, or very similar to the jacket that uh, Mark was wearing. And that might indeed attract the attention of persons that night. Right. So to sum up, you need to find the hitchhiker on that day, the one who hitched a ride in the lorry, anybody else who was at the fair that day to come forward, who hasn't come forward already, and the man in Langborough Road, who was seen in Langborough Road towards the evening. Indeed we would. In addition to that, I would also like to say, as a parent, as I'm sure many of the viewers are parents, we can only imagine the anguish this family have faced over the last 12 months. We will pursue the inquiry relentlessly. Please, if anyone has any information additional to what we've asked for, please come forward and contact us. Thank you very much indeed. And if you think you know anything that might help us to find Mark, here's the number again, 01-811-8055. Or you can ring Thames Valley Police at Reading on 0734 585 one. That's 0734, the code for Reading, 585 one. Our first reconstruction this month is about a murder. Jackie Waynes was 35, the mother of three children. Her husband had deserted her and the children had been taken into care. Jackie was a prostitute, working on the streets of Bristol. She was murdered on the evening of the 20th of April. It was a bitterly cold Saturday night, a time which locals might remember because there were a lot of visitors in the area for the last day of the badminton horse trials. Our reconstruction starts in St Paul's near Bristol's city centre. Jackie worked the streets of St Paul's where everyone, it seems, knew her. But she was a loner. She only had one real friend, Avril Miles, with whom she shared a house. As far as I'm concerned, it, she was more a sister than anything else. She's a good kid, you know. If anybody wanted any help, she would give them. She wouldn't ask twice. But if she wanted help from them, it's a different thing altogether. They judged Jackie because um, she's dressed scruffy, she was this, she was that. But, I mean, people just go by the way she was dressed. You don't judge people like that. Jackie worked that Saturday night after visiting Avril in hospital. It's back on again, yeah, it? a bit nifty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lots of people saw her between 8 and 10 o'clock. At a quarter to 11, she walked up Brigstock Road with another girl. I got picked up last night. When they let me go, I come back out and did a 30. Mm -hmm. The red Cortina was parked on the corner of Hepburn Road, where Jackie lived. Since she got straight into the car, without negotiating first, her friend wondered if Jackie knew the man. She remembers him as having curly, blonde hair. He turned right at the top of Brigstock Road, into Ashley Road. By ten past eleven, Jackie had returned to the area, Ashley Road in the middle of St Paul's. A prostitute saw her on the other side of the street, getting into a small escort type of van. She didn't see it drive away. Ten minutes later, when she looked again, Jackie was walking the other way, up Ashley Road. It was the last time she was seen alive. At midnight, nine miles away, some young men were on their way home from a night on the town. They pulled into a track off Perrin Pit Lane, a country road near Frampton Cottrell. They were listening to music and smoking. They had no idea of what was to happen in the next 20 minutes. Oh, 
at ten past twelve, Mr. and Mrs. Shilson passed the end of the track where the boys were parked. Look at that chap touching rubbish. We ought to take his number and report him to the council. The van must have parked only yards behind the boys, yet they hadn't noticed it. <laughs> but at about 12.15, some time after the van had gone, they did see a dark Cortina arrive. At 20 past 12, Craig Howell and his girlfriend Julie passed the same corner. They too saw the Cortina, and then they saw what looked as if it could be a body. Julie turned the car round further down the lane, but by the time they got back to the spot, the Cortina had gone. Jackie's body was found only an hour after she was last seen alive. She'd been stabbed several times. I want people to help the police to find him before he does it again. You know, you don't know who it's going to be next. A tragic end there to a sad life. Detective Superintendent Malcolm Hughes is in charge of that investigation. Is there any apparent motive that you can find so far? Well, the motive certainly isn't robbery, because when her body was found, she still had money with her. There are two possibilities, really, I think. One, that she had some sort of argument with a client of hers. Or the more sinister possibility that somebody went out with the express intention of killing a prostitute, or Jackie in particular. She didn't seem, from what I know, to have been a very argumentative sort of person. No, that, that is quite true, and it seems that the latter is the case. And we seem to have a very dangerous man still at large. Now you need to trace a number of people, as we saw in our reconstruction. First of all, the man in the red cortina with the curly blonde hair. Yes, we know that at about 10.45 p.m. that night, she got into a red cortina in Brigstock Road. Uh, it, all, the, all the indications are that she may have known this man. He's a man with blonde hair, fair hair, which was curly and may have been highlighted. And they drove off into Ashley Road. Now, if she did know that man, she may have had some conversation and told him of her, of her intentions that night, which, of course, would be important to so us. So you'd like him to come forward. You'd also like the man who was seen there in the escort type of van. We don't know exactly what sort of van it was or even what colour it was, but we need the man who was driving that van to come forward. Yes, at about ten past eleven in Ashley Road, she was seen to get into an, a, a van, which is the same si size as an escort van, but uh, we don't know the colour of it. That man is important, but he, he appears to be the last man that we know that spoke to her. Right, if we can just get the geography straight of the area. To, Jackie's body was actually found there at Frampton Cottrell, which is a small village about nine miles north of the centre of Bristol. How long would it have taken, in fact, to drive there on the M32? It takes about 15 minutes, in fact. But, of course, Jackie could have been murdered anywhere between St Paul's and the spot where her body was found and taken there and dumped. Right. Well, it was in Perrinpit Lane where she was found, and there's a bridle path, which we're going to see in a minute, um, which is where those two boys were parked, those boys were parked listening to music. There it is, and was, there's the track where they were listening to the music. And her body was dumped just about ten yards behind their car at the start of that bridle path, is that right? Yes, that's right. Now what about the white van that was seen in that lane, Perrin Pit Lane, by the couple passing by? Yes, I believe this is probably the most important sighting of the lot. Uh, Mr and Mrs Shilston drove past her at about ten past twelve on the Sunday morning. They saw the white van and standing beside it they saw a man who's described as slim build, uh, wearing blue jeans and a multicoloured bomber jacket, similar in every respect to this one. It's not an entirely uncommon jacket, but... No, indeed it's not. They're, they're quite popular. But we know that that man was wearing that type of jacket. Now, at his feet, he had a white bundle, a large white bundle, they described it as, and uh, I believe that that was the body of Jacqueline Waynes. The van itself is white, it's rather larger than a transit type van and more importantly it had on the offside uh, some damage it looked like an impact mark and some scratches as you can see there now we would uh, obviously want to locate that vehicle 
And certainly we'd want to locate a man who wore a jacket like this who would have access to a vehicle like that. And it's just possible that somebody may have patched up that damage on the offside of that van? Yes, indeed. Uh, if anybody knows of a vehicle which has had that sort of damage repaired, then of course we would want to talk to them. Of course. And also the man driving the dark-coloured Mark IV or Mark V Cortina that we saw there. Yes, that's intriguing. He hasn't come forward. I believe he must have seen something. And it's very important that I see him, and I'm quite prepared to see him anywhere and in complete confidence. Now, you've never found one of her shoes. That might provide a clue if you can find the other one of her shoes. Yes, that's true. Uh, Jackie was wearing a pair of shoes, and this is the right one. The left one is missing, despite quite an extensive search. We haven't found it. If anybody has found or knows the location of a sandal like that, then, of course, we would want to speak to them. And all these people you'd like to come <coughs> forward, and this is an absolute confidence, of course, isn't it? Yes, indeed. The, the, I'm not in, interested on why those people were down in St Paul's, if they were looking for the services of a prostitute. That doesn't worry me. I need their help. And I would want them to come forward and talk to me tonight in confidence. To prevent another tragic murder like that? Yes, indeed. Thank you very much indeed. If you can help, please do ring us. It is in absolute confidence. You can speak to a BBC researcher if you prefer. The number 01811 Or you can call Avon and Somerset Police at Bristol, 565 treble 3. That's 0272, the code for Bristol, 565 treble 3. We start this month with a murder. It's particularly disturbing because it's believed it could have been racially motivated. Just over six weeks ago, Mrs. Shamira Kassam and her three children died when a fire was deliberately started at their home in Chadwell Heath, Essex. Mrs. Kassam was expecting a fourth child, which would have been due this month. The police reconstruction here shows how the house in Oakwood Gardens was probably entered by someone climbing through the kitchen window. Once inside, four or five pints of petrol were poured in the hallway and set alight. Whoever it was left by the back door. It happened at 5 to 4 in the morning on the 13th of July, that's late Friday night, early Saturday. Just minutes before the fire started, a car was seen speeding away from the house in Green Lane, just around the corner. It's thought to have been an orange Toyota automatic, like this one, made in the mid-70s. The car has not been traced. As neighbours and passers-by tried desperately to rescue the family, a red Vauxhall Cavalier with an A registration stopped opposite the house. There were four or five men inside, and none of them made any attempt to help. One man got out and stood watching the fire. He was later seen at the front of the house holding a brick. This is a new Crime Watch video fit of that man. He's about 35, 5 foot 10, well built with mousy brown hair, a moustache, and he may have been wearing glasses with metal frames. There had been two previous arson attacks on that same house. One was in December 1982, when another Asian family was living there, and one on the 16th of June this year. That was just a month before that fatal fire. Detective Chief Superintendent Don Gibson is leading the inquiry. Mr Gibson, a really tragic, appalling crime. Yes, quite horrific. In fact, the police officers who were first on the scene were appalled by what they saw. Was this, in your view, a racist attack? It's a frightening possibility that it may have been racially motivated, but there's no evidence to show that it was. It's a terrible attack. There's no getting away from that. But there's no evidence to show that it was racially motivated. So therefore, we are looking at this aspect along with six other lines of inquiry. But that was the second attack on this house in, in less than a month. And, increase, and there are increasing numbers of racial attacks in your particular area. What what protection are you giving to Asian families in your area now? Well, I think it's right to say at the beginning that um, there are a lot of attacks taking place on Asian families. Whether they're racial or not is, is a matter that's got to be decided on later on. But uh, in response to the, f the second attack, which occurred on the 16th of June, special units of the SPG have been drafted in, dog handlers, DSU, quite a lot of police officers put in there purely and simply to try and reassure the people who live in that area. Now, for people watching tonight, how might they be able to help you with this crime? Well, first of all, we want the person who was driving the Toyota to come forward and be identified. He might be able to give us quite invaluable information. Then there's the driver and the four people who were with, with, with the, the driver in the A registration Cavalier. We feel that they could also give us some useful information. And perhaps we could have one more look at the video fit of that <clears throat> man. Yes, as you can see, he's about 30 to 35 years of age, 5 foot 10. He's uh, got mousy brown hair. <clears throat> quite smartly dressed and, and I think we must bear in mind that it's about four o'clock in the morning so he may have been to a nightclub or something along those lines but most particularly of all we would like to speak to anyone who's got 
any connection or any knowledge of the Kassam family. And of that, I, I mean not just Mr. Kassam and his wife, but also Mr. Kassam's brother, who was in the house, very badly injured, and is still in hospital. We'll let you get to the phones. Mr. Gibson, thank you very much. The number to ring is Chadwell Heath Police Station on 01597 0025. And that number is also, incidentally, given on these posters, which police are now distributing around the central London and Essex area. Or you can ring us here in the studio on 01 811 8055. Sergeant Desmond Michael is one of the officers working with Chief Superintendent Gibson on the case. He speaks Hindi. And there are BBC researchers here too who speak Gujarati, Punjabi and Hindi. They are all now waiting to take your call. In our next reconstruction, we're taking you back exactly seven weeks to Preston in Lancashire. It's an especially sad story because the victim was a nine-year-old boy, Imran Vora. We start in Avenham in Preston on Thursday the 11th of July. At Frenchwood Junior School, it's the last lesson of the day. Not just half the insects, we get a mirror image. If we put the mirror there, as we've tried before, we get the full E. So what I want you to do with your worksheets is take the first worksheet with the capital letter shapes on. And Imran was a cheerful boy. His teachers found him reliable and he was popular with classmates, though reserved and rather quiet. Find in those capital letters. He loved sports. Just the previous afternoon, he'd won several prizes at the school sports day. Is that the only line of symmetry? Is it? You've checked it. Okay, so there's the bell. Uh, we need to pack away quickly today, so can you just slip everything into your drawer, please? Take care going home, and we'll see you tomorrow. School finished at 3.15, but this Thursday, Imran and some of his friends stayed in the playground to play marbles for a while. The game over, Imran would normally walk home with his friends. Are you not coming home today? Nah, I'm ready for here for some I'll see you tomorrow. He didn't say who he was waiting for. From this point on, precisely what happened is unclear. When one of Imran's classmates left the school, Imran was still standing at the gate. She thinks she saw a young Asian man across the road. Imran! And she says he called out to Imran. She's fairly sure he crossed over to the man and that they walked off together. Less certain is a sighting just after four o'clock in Avenham Lane. A witness saw a small boy crying. He thinks the boy was wearing a beige and brown anorak with a red stripe, similar to Imran's. The boy disappeared down Shepherd Street. Another possibility, about 4.15, a motorist saw a boy a little further down Avenham Lane. He was in the company of a scruffy looking man, maybe in his 40s. They were heading in the direction of Avenham Park. It's a popular area with open spaces and woodland used by many people as a shortcut. At about 4.30, this woman clearly recalls seeing a small boy in a beige and brown anorak. The boy was on his own, and when she glanced back, he was gone. Any of these sightings could have been of Imran, for he often came to Avonham Park to play. He had a series of dens all over the park, and he'd spend many afternoons here, sometimes with friends, often alone. What's known for certain is that on Thursday afternoon, Imran failed to turn up for lessons at the local mosque. He was due there with all the other Muslim children in the area at five o'clock. By nine o'clock, when he still hadn't come home, his parents were so worried that they decided to call in the police. Neighbours were alerted and on Friday morning, the police launched a major inquiry. They appealed for information in English and in Urdu. <laughs> Imran 
They began a thorough search of the whole district. It went on late into Friday night and was resumed at 5 a.m., first light on Saturday. Many of the family's friends and neighbors joined in to help. 40 minutes later, at a place known locally as the Tipping Area, here near the old tram bridge, they found him run. He was lying in one of his dens. He'd been sexually assaulted and strangled. Superintendent John Boy, this is a ghastly crime. Yes, it is. It's a horrible sexual crime. Uh, Imran was a victim of a horrible sexual assault. He probably, when the assault was being committed, he probably had a ligature around his neck. This ligature uh, subsequently strangled him. Now, there must have been people who saw Imran that day and who saw whoever was the killer, though they may not have realised anything significant in what they saw. Let's just remind ourselves that we've got a map which shows where the body was found. Yeah. And there it is by the old uh, the, tram, by the old tram bridge in Avonham yes. Park. Yes. Now the school is where in relation. The school is on the right. Frenchwood Junior School. About four or five hundred yards away. Okay. Now it was there at Frenchwood School, of course, that one of Imran's friends saw him with an older man. She's pretty sure of that, isn't yes. she? Yes. She is a schoolmate of Imran's, and she knew Imran. She saw Imran standing at the school gate, and she saw a man across the road who was described as being about five foot ten or six foot in his late twenties, slim, black hair. She just said he was an Asian man and she knows the Asian community. Now obviously we badly need to find anyone who knew uh, Imran in relation to an older man. Yes, uh, that's correct. If, if it is true that this man picked Imran up from school then Imran must have known him beforehand and we would like to know of the association. Now what about people in the park? There must have been lots of people, potential witnesses there. There's a lot of people in the park who originally were unidentified. A number of them now have been identified. We urgently need these people to come forward. They might think they can't help us, but we need to eliminate them because we have their descriptions and probably we have the description of the killer. Now, I gather that the park is sometimes used by gays, by homosexuals. Um, they may be reluctant to call in. Yes, uh, a number of them frequent the public conveniences in the park. It's their focal point. We have, have interviewed a large number of them, but to be in fairness to them, they are cooperating and they are giving us information. There was a boy seen running from the park. I know that you, you really want to trace him badly, to eliminate him. About 4.15, a boy was seen in running along South Meadow Lane, away from the park. He, he's about 15, fairish, gin, fairish ginger hair, uh, a cream-coloured shirt and a grey sweater and green slacks. The thing about him was that he looked frightened and he was running faster than he would normally do on a jogging run. And I know that a week before the murder, a man was seen with a younger Asian boy. On the Thursday before the murder, about 400 yards away from the murder scene, a man who is described as being uh, 35 to 40 years was seen in Miller Park, which adjoins Avonham Park, at 4.30. He was seen in some bushes with a 10-year-old boy who was an Asian boy. There is no evidence that this was Imran, and it probably wasn't Imran. OK, so you need to find him, and indeed anyone else, to eliminate themselves, but also just in case they saw something which will fit in with something else we that you We need these know. people to come forward to assist the inquiries. All right, and kids, of course, uh, if you can help in any way, I don't know, if you were smoking in the park or doing something you don't want to tell your parents, please do, it's so important. If you think you can help with any leads at all, please tell your parents, please call us, it's in confidence. And here's the number, 01811 8055. The incident room is at Preston on 54811. That's 0772 54811. Reconstruction tonight concerns the murder of a 61-year-old shopkeeper in Bristol exactly six weeks ago. Roy Page ran a corner sweet shop in the old part of Bedminster and regularly stayed open from early morning to late in the evening. His body was found in the back of the shop on Thursday the 18th of July. Whoever killed him left behind one vital clue, this earpiece. A man wearing an identical earpiece and claiming to be a gas board engineer visited two tobacconists in the north of Bristol on the morning of that same day. By the afternoon, he had then moved south of the city to Bedminster, which is where our reconstruction begins. Roy Page had been running his corner shop for 10 years. He often spent a lot of his day watching the television between customers. 
Bedminster is a small community and most of his customers were regulars. Have a marsh bar, please. Hello. He had a safe in the back of his shop but had a habit of leaving it open to get change when he needed it. Since his wife died three years ago, his sister Shirley came round every Thursday to help in the house. This money here, I'm putting it back in the safe. You worry too much. Okay, I'm off now. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye, sis. See you tomorrow. Bye. At about half past four that afternoon, a man was seen hanging around outside the shop. He was carrying what looked like a small transistor radio and wearing an earpiece and headsets. Minutes later, the same man was seen outside another tobacconist in the next street. Tom Coles, who lives opposite Roy, would pop in several times a day. Hello, Roy. Can I have a lemon Hello. cigar, please? Wait. Hey. I was earlier today. Well, not too bad. Just part with it, I suppose. I'll see you later on. OK, bye for now. At a quarter to five, the man in blue overalls was seen crossing the road away from Roy's shop. I'm checking for gas leaks in the area, up and down this road. I've got a meet around the corner. Have you got any gas leaks here at all? No, none at all. Have you tried the lady around the corner? Yeah, I'll do it now. He'd now been wandering around this small area for a good half an hour. Hello? Hello, I'm looking for a gas leak. Have you got any gas? Oh, I haven't. I've got it on. Please. Do you mind if I no. have got some? No, Because Please. I've had okay. reports in the area of a yes, gas leak, okay. you see. Well, there you are, Alec. Like. Oh, it's just a gas service. Is there anything yes. You just got this one. Are there any other gas appliances anywhere? Well, not in this room, in the other room. Yeah, what happened to you then? Well... After several minutes, during which the man appeared genuine, he then began to act strangely. You ever got a glass of water? Yes, of course. But I think you'd better let me do it because... All right. There's a terrible tap. He was sweating heavily. Perhaps you'd like a cup of tea, would you? No, I can't, I'll son, because my well. mate's going up the other side I'm of the hammer. Well, no, well, don't worry, because... He we'll... suddenly appeared agitated and anxious to get away. I've got to join him. There's other gas leaks in the air, you see. I'm sorry about that, look. He crossed the road back towards Roy Page's shop. ahead of him, about 100 yards ahead, is the Suez Canal, a big wide ditch that runs right across this 14th fairway. 20 minutes had passed when Mrs. Martina Allen came in. She is the last known person to have seen Roy Page alive. You want one with roses? how much? £1.34. Quiet, isn't it? Yeah. Yet three further items have been rung up on the till after she left. Tom Coles had noticed that the shop had been closed for a little while. He knew Roy was a diabetic and was worried that he might be ill. News from the BBC with Sue Lawley and Andrew Harvey. Today, he did not think the children who went down the cliff were in any immediate danger. It's the fourth day of the inquest into the deaths of four of his pupils. The battle against the drug traffickers. The government is sending undercover agents. Big pay increases have been recommended for top civil servants, judges and senior members of the armed forces. Mrs. Thatcher has... Two hours later, at a quarter to eight, the police had been called. Designed to be a little bit of a car. So, as the driver operates the 
I'll try and find where the meter is. <coughs> Check that ring up. <coughs> Neil, they're there. Sometime between 20 past five and 10 past six, Roy Page had been murdered. I think so. You better get an ambulance. Right, okay. <coughs> I'll go outside. Every gas appliance in the house had been turned full on. Well, Detective Superintendent Lou Clark, you're quite precise about the time that Roy was killed. Well, Mrs Allen says she left the shop about 5.20. We know that people went between 5.20 and about 6.10 and couldn't get in. The, the door was bolted and a man was seen coming from the side of the shop. Uh, the one on the side. We have a reconstruction of what was seen, yes. Yes, about 6.10 to 6.15. The man was identical to the man seen earlier, posing as the gas board man. This time he was carrying something under his arm. We suspect that was the overall which would now have been bloodstained. We have a video fit of the <clears> man, if we can take a closer look at him once again. He's yes. very heavily built, isn't he? He is, some witnesses say, about 15 stone or more. He's a big man, 5 foot 11 or more, 35 to 45 years, dark hair, and perhaps had a Welsh accent wearing spectacles. Why was Mr Page murdered? Was the motive theft? I would have thought it was theft and uh, I think it was a bungled crime. I think we're looking for a petty thief who goes in to distract shopkeepers and people in their homes so that he can steal. And I think Mr Page caught him stealing, trapped him, and he had to kill Mr Page to get out of the shop. Well, as I said earlier, there was one vital clue left behind. It's this earpiece, which you're quite convinced, are you, that it was the killer who left this earpiece beside It Mr. certainly Page. didn't belong to Mr Page. And we know that that earpiece looked like this in its original state, um, from a typical transistor radio, some years old. But um, we know it didn't belong to the deceased. And a witness saw the gas man wearing an identical piece shortly after 4.30 that day. And he was seen carrying a small black box too. Would this have been connected to a transistor radio? Well, or? that's what we think. He's most probably using it to make people believe he's got some sort of instrument for detecting gas leaks. What exactly did he steal? <clears throat> he stole a cream-coloured plastic purse, which had £700 in it, a white envelope with a name Paul written on the side in handwriting, that had £200, at least £149 from the till, and surprising, a hairbrush from the bedroom upstairs. This is the matching mirror that he didn't take, and as you see, there doesn't seem to be any reason to steal that at all, but it's missing from the premises. It's gone. And one thing I would like to say is that the deceased in this case was an ordinary working man. He worked seven days a week, 7.30 in the morning to 8.30 in the evening. And his two sons and daughter are just the same, hard-working, ordinary people who are putting their life savings into offering a £5,000 reward leading to the arrest and conviction of their father's killer. I hope you get some calls. Thank you very much indeed, Lou Clark. Indeed, if you think you can help, please don't hesitate to call us 01811 or you can call Bristol Police on 267 986. There's the number 0272 for Bristol, 267 986. Detectives have been baffled for over a year now by the death of a London woman, Beverly Trendle. Police found her body in her flat about a month after her death. She'd been stabbed. Beverly's diary and some of her personal letters were missing. Exactly when she died is not certain. What is known is that from Halloween onwards, October the 31st last year, Beverly wasn't seen again. Why she died is a mystery too, unless you can remember something which could lead police to her killer. Beverly's mother, Betty, agreed to appear in our reconstruction in the hope that something might jog your memory. You just feel so cold inside, you know, it's such a dreadful thing to happen, and not knowing what's happened or who's done it. And this is the awful thing about it, I think. She didn't flit about with a lot of people and get involved in different things. You know, you can't, you just can't understand why. Beverly Trendle lived in a council flat on this estate in Northolt, West London. When she moved here four years ago, she'd been very pleased to get a place of her own. Beverly's flat was very compact the way she'd worked it out. Everything was worked out to a, a definite degree, you know, so that she had everything just where she wanted it and there was nothing sort of out of place, really. She had this large book, like an exercise book. I think she would have put in it the things that happened, particularly from day to day, that, or something new had 
a curd, she would put it in there, that sort of thing. She was very precise and she did uh, enjoy her privacy very much. This is the reason that she never told people to casually drop in. She was like a different person in Spain. I don't know, as soon as she got there, she seemed to change completely. The sun, she loved the sun, and she loved to be sort of casually dressed and sort of just wander around. ¿Cómo está usted? ¿Cómo está usted? She definitely would have liked to settle in Spain, and I think really this was it. She wanted to get her Spanish to perfection. So, of course, she decided she would take these lessons. Buenas tardes, señorita. Buenas tardes, señorita. The weekly lessons took place at her Spanish teacher's house. She had booked one for six o'clock on Wednesday, October the 31st, Halloween. She didn't arrive. Her movements throughout that week are a mystery. You like to repeat them straight after me. Police do know that on the Monday, she started a part-time job for a cleaning company. It's your first day here as well, is it? Yes, it is. Still half asleep, it's that bleeding early. It's the worst thing about this job. I'm trying to get an evening job. Mind you, the traffic's not bad this time in the morning. Oh, you've got a car then? Yeah, it's old, but it goes. I won't mind an evening job. I'm going for an interview at Hillington Hospital on Thursday. I think there might be something going at Heathrow. Mind you, evenings. I wouldn't like to think I was losing my evening. No, well, there is that about. The Byron pub is just round the corner from Beverly's flat. She was also seen there that week. The barmaid was Vivian Starsmere. Uh, two halves of lager, pineapple and orange, please. She remembers taking that order from a man in his 30s who was having a drink with Beverly and two other people. None of her companions that night have been seen since. <laughs> Pubs were a place of often meeting somebody or just going to dropping in with somebody, but they weren't somewhere that she went sort of all the time or or even say once a week. Isn't he lovely? You can always see his beard got in photos. He says it's the way he's sitting. <laughs> well, he looks all right to me. I'll bring some of mine in tomorrow if you like. Who's that then? Well, I got quite a few of my bloke in Spain, Pepe, because I haven't been over there since May. Actually, I've got a new boyfriend. Going out tonight for a drink, as a matter of fact. Well, see you like then. Well, I haven't known him only a few weeks, but he's, uh, he's older than me. What, about 40? Yeah. He's not bad looking. He's got a really nice personality. I see now, and I suppose he's taking you out in his big fast motor tonight, is he? <laughs> no, I'll take mine. Enjoy yourself. Yeah. See you tomorrow. See ya. But Janet Swan didn't see Beverly again. In fact, she was possibly the last person Beverly spoke to. We know she went home that Wednesday after work. She always used to park her car so that she could see it from her flat. It could have been that afternoon, certainly it was one day around then, that a neighbour remembers seeing something that surprised her, a rare visitor in Beverly's flat. <laughs> Early that evening, children toured the estate playing Halloween games. But at Beverly's door, there was no answer. I feel now at this stage, if, if something can be done, I owe it to her for, for her sake. And also for maybe somebody else. Who knows? Well, Detective Inspector Roger Parsons has been in charge of this investigation for the past year and still no clue, for example, as to who those people in the pub were. 
No, we've carried out extensive inquiries on these people and um, they haven't yet come forward and they could, could be very important witnesses and I do ask them, uh, if they see this programme or people know them, ask them to come and contact us at Southall Police Station. Can we have your description of them? There was two men, aged about 30 years. We have not a lot more description. They were just about 5'8 average. But with them was the uh, the uh, the, sem the coloured girl. She's a half-caste, but very attractive with an Afro-style hair, and I feel sure she would have stood out in the bar and public house. Mm. What about the man who was seen waving at Beverly's flat window? Any leads on him? Again, we have no leads, and this, is again, is a very important clue because Beverly kept her flat to herself and to allow a man into the flat would mean that she knew him well and again I ask him to come forward if he sees the picture of himself or if people know him to notify us please. Mm. And no description of him at all? Again about 35 years, a he grey hair, uh, swept back um, and as I say um, quite attractive. That's and the diary, is, is that a very important clue, the diary and the personal letters that went missing? This diary is very important, it went missing, it's never been found uh, this is a mock-up, but Beverly kept every item that she did during a day in this book. And without a doubt, if we found this, it could well solve this crime. Now, there's also some mystery surrounding Beverly's car. Her white Volkswagen was being driven down Yedding Lane, Northolt, very near where she lived, seen the day after it's thought that she died. And it wasn't parked in its usual position in the car park when her body was actually found. So how much significance do you attach to that? I attach attach a lot of significance to it because as you can see from the where the car's parked uh, Beverly couldn't see it and one sh thing she always did she parked the car opposite her kitchen window so she could see it because it was a pride and joy and and she can't be seen from that window from her flat. Can you think of any reason why she should have been killed? None at all. I've been on the case for a year I feel I know Beverly like a sister uh, she was a, a nice girl she had very few friends, but most friends, they liked her and there is no reason why this has occurred. Um, and I ask people to come forward and, and help us on this inquiry. Yes, we need the people in the pub and we need the car and we need the man in the flat. If you can help, give us a ring on 01 811 8055 or ring Police Direct at Southall Police Station. The number there is 01 900 8147 or 8148. That's 01 900 8147 or 8148. Curiously, Crime Watch isn't so much about crime as about its victims. It's these victims that have aroused your sympathy and your concern. And our next reconstruction is all about one victim who lived alone in St Paul's in Bristol. Mrs Violet Milsom was 62. She was a grandmother, and six weeks ago, someone murdered her. When police arrived at her flat, they, and the medical crews as well, were shocked and distressed by the injuries that had been inflicted on her. They began a search for clues. They now want to enlist your help. Our reconstruction begins nearly a month before her death in Bristol. It shows none of the violence, only the events that led up to it. Phil, I would like to talk more about that, but we'll pause some music first. The radio orchestra, appropriately, the Song of Summer. Violet Milsom lived alone in a dingy basement flat. Her grandchildren were welcome visitors, but they couldn't get to see her often, and she was a lonely soul, with Ginger her only company. She was rather scared as well. Each night she lodged a little message in her window to ward off strangers. At 6pm, as St Paul's began to come alive, Violet's day was almost over. Tuesday, September the 3rd, at about 10 o'clock, She disturbed three young men who'd smashed a pane of glass in her door. Thursday, the 26th of September, three weeks on and five days before she died, Violet went shopping for a chest of drawers. The owner remembers Violet because she couldn't spare a tenner from her weekly pension and she agreed to give him a deposit. 
Yeah. We'll go and leave a fiver deposit, then we'll uh, give you a receipt, and then we'll go pick it when you want. Right, we'll get you a receipt. Thanks. Next day, Friday the 27th, the owner saw Violet once again. She seemed to know this man. If it was you, or if you know who he is, please call us. Monday, September the 30th. It's pension day, and having collected her allowance, Violet went to do the weekly shopping. It wasn't hard to spend about five pounds of the 36 on Rice Krispies, tin soup and cat food. That afternoon, a helpful neighbour was doing some gardening for Violet. When do you think you'll be able to come and finish it then? I don't think it'll be tonight. Oh, don't you come tonight? I never open my door after six o'clock, you know. Well, it'll probably be sometime tomorrow. After her neighbour left, Violet went to fetch the evening paper. As far as we know, it's the last time she left her home alive. What happened next was seen in detail by a witness sitting right across the street. Old Sam, an ageing tramp, was in his usual doorway outside the Shady Grove Cafe. And another witness, David Crowley, remembers walking past the flat that night because at about eight o'clock, three youths came out of a garden and pushed past him. And another witness, on her way home at midnight, remembers a man appearing from a gateway near Violet's flat. Old Sam saw all of this as well. He must have done. Yet, ironically, though he can see, he doesn't understand. He lives in a world of his own. Next morning, Violet's neighbour came back to do the gardening as he'd promised. When he'd finished, he went down to the flat to borrow a broom. He discovered Violet's body. She'd been strangled, sexually assaulted, and horribly mutilated. Detective Superintendent Malcolm Hughes is the man seeking the killers, and you've been in charge of murder investigations before, but this, I think, is the worst, or certainly one of the worst you've ever come across. Yes, I've, I've dealt with a number of murders, and without a doubt, this is one of the worst, yes. You brought a clue. What's this? This is a belt, I believe, from a summer dress. When we found Mrs. Milson's body, uh, this was tied around her wrist, and without doubt, has been used by the killer to tie her up. Not necessarily hers, you think, then? It's, a, it's what? It's nylon? Yes, it's a nylon material. It looks as though it's from a summer dress. Uh, despite all our inquiries, we cannot be sure this belonged to Mrs. Milson and could well have been taken there by her killer. Right. Now, there were several witnesses, as we saw, and people that you badly need to trace. Uh, let's start, if we can, with the, the three youths who were seen, uh, they sort of bumped into... Well, actually, there was the man, of course, first at the trading post, wasn't there, with, yes. the, with the long hair. What do we know about yes. him? Well, we know that he was with Mrs. Milson. They appeared to be quite friendly and obviously knew each other. Now, despite all our inquiries, we haven't found him yet. And I would like to speak to him, obviously. Right. Then there was the witness, David Crowley, walking past three youths bumped into him coming out of a garden. Yes, that was about 8 o'clock on Monday the 30th. Uh, I'm not saying they are the murderers, but they were certainly in the area at a very important time, and uh, I would like to talk to them. And, of course, the man coming out of the gate, I think, very close to her house at about midnight. Yes, he's an interesting man. He was coming out of a gate next door to hers. Uh, despite all our inquiries, nobody knows him in that house. Nobody knows him in Mrs Milsom's house. Uh, and it's very important I find him and talk to him. We'll come back to just how important in, in a moment, but you've got a card there. Can we just have a look at that and, and why...? Yes, indeed. When we looked at when, uh, Mrs Milson's belongings at, at her flat and amongst some documentation, we found this card. It's a Christmas card. On the front, it says, For my sweetheart at Christmas. Inside, 
it says to Violet from Steve. Now, despite speaking to all her relatives and friends, we have not been able to find Steve, and I would again like to speak to him. You want to speak, in fact, to anybody who knew Violet Nelson? Yes, I do. Now, you're really worried about this murder for a particular reason. Can you explain what it is? Mrs. Nelson was brutally and sadistically killed. I believe that the man who killed her is mentally disturbed and dangerous. I also believe if he's not caught, he may kill again. I also believe that somebody knows who he is, or may suspect they know who he is. And if there's anybody who knows who, who killed Mrs. Milson, or who suspects somebody of killing her, then please come forward and speak to me, because they may prevent another terrible crime. You really think it's a, a, a likelihood that this I think it's a possibility that he will kill again, yes. Well, if you think you can help, please do ring us here in the studio. Here's the number, 01-811-8055. Remember, you can speak in absolute confidence. Or you can ring Bristol Police at Trinity Road Police Station, Bristol 267985. That's 0272 267 985. In our October programme, we asked you to identify this small ticket. West Yorkshire Police believe it could lead them to the killer of 66-year-old Sandy McClelland. He was stabbed to death, and this ticket was found near his body on October the 7th this year. We received a lot of calls about it, and we can now reveal far more about this strange case. Tonight, for the first time, a number of unusual forensic clues will be made public by the man who's leading the inquiry, Detective Superintendent Ken Baines. First of all, though, let's see our reconstruction. There was snow on the ground when we actually made the film, but remember we were having fine and sunny weather in September when Sandy McClellan disappeared from his home in Leeds. Sandy lived on this estate in Winmore on the outskirts of the city. Every Friday he'd walk down to the local pub, the Penders Arms, where he was known by a lot of the regulars. Sandy's stepson, Brian Horn, and wife Elizabeth lived just round the corner from his flat. They spent a lot of time together, and Sandy looked forward to the Friday pint and game of dominoes. Since he rarely socialised with anyone else, the Horns were a little surprised when he told them that someone was coming to stay overnight at the flat. We now know that Sandy McClellan had a visitor on the evening of 5th of September. That's exactly a week before he went missing. We're led to believe that this man is called Stuart. Brian and Elizabeth Horn, the stepson and stepdaughter, tell us that they visited the flat about quarter to 11 on that Thursday evening and actually saw Sandy with this man, who's about 30 years of age, five foot six to five foot eight, with sandy colored hair or light brown hair. He told the Horns that he was separated, that he got two children. Very, very vital that we find him as soon as possible. Uh, oh, this is Stuart. He's, uh, he's come down to Leeds about a, a driving job. <laughs> well, you know, like a cup of coffee. Ah, you're lucky. The kettle's on. <laughs> you think you get your job done? Oh, should do. You know, I've got exams, CSEs, O levels, oh, and references. It should be okay. Uh, we've been down the red line. What a bind. <laughs> you should have come for me all the way, were you? Uh, well, I didn't know what you were about, did I? Yeah, yeah. Has your coffee? Yep. Yeah, this one. Like a no, not it would seem that the purpose of the visit with this man, Stewart, was to try to get a driving job in the Leeds area, possibly with, connected with the mining industry. So therefore I want every possible firm or every firm in the area visiting with a view to seeing if they had anybody or set anybody on or interviewed somebody around about the 5th or 6th of September for such a job. Now we've got to concentrate on the evening of Thursday the 12th of September, that's the, the last night time he was last seen alive. We know now that he went to the Asda supermarket at Crossgate with Brian and Elizabeth Horn in Sandy's own car, that's the Ford Cortina, the light green one. They were accompanied by the 16-year-old granddaughter, Lynn, who they dropped off en route. They went into the supermarket. The indications are, as far as the horns are concerned, that Sandy was in a very, very good mood. There was quite a lot of by-play between them whilst they were going around the supermarket. Uh, hello. <laughs> Have you got everything now? Yeah. I think so. I think so. i see you later. Hi. Yeah. 
They came back from the supermarket to the Holmes house in White Lath Approach. It would seem that the car was driven by Brian both to the supermarket and back to their house. Hey, come on in. Oh, I've gotten a bit of heartburn. I think I, I think I'll go him. Have a bath. Take an early night. Aye. Give us the keys, lad. Yeah, we'll see you later, innit? Aye. Aye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. And then Sandy drove the car, it would seem, back to his own flat in Willowgarth Avenue. About ten minutes later, there was a knock on the door at the horns and Sandy had come back. Brian! Ah, oh, you left your cigarettes? <laughs> no doubt you'll need them before the morning. <laughs> See you, Brian. Oh, good night, lad. Good night. Good night. He left the house straight away, but we do not know whether he drove off or whether he would come back to the house in his car or whether he walked back to his flat. That is the last positive sighting that we have got of Sandy McClelland still alive at 8.20 p.m. when he left there. The next positive sighting that we've got of Sandy McClelland's motor car is at 11.30 a.m. on Monday the 7th of October when it was found on the car park in the centre of Big House known as the Bethel Street car park. This car park is adjacent to the Calder and Hebel Canal. It's also adjacent to the Wheelers Working Men's Club. Quite a busy club that seems to have a considerable number of members there. Wheelers was busy the night Sandy disappeared. There were several charity acts on and the place was full. Perhaps you were there. Remember it was Thursday, September the 12th. Could you have seen Sandy's car in the car park, either that night or any time afterwards? We need to be getting in amongst the shoppers to see if we can establish, first of all, when the car was left there, and if possible, of course, establishing who exactly or actually left the car on the car park. So police need to speak to anyone who knew or saw Sandy or his green Ford Cortina in the Leeds Brig House area around September the 12th. They'd also like anyone who's known Sandy to contact them tonight. He has moved around a lot in his life. He lived in Edinburgh for many years, so perhaps you knew him then. In 1968, he moved to Corby for a job as a storeman with the local council. Then he lived in Grantham for three years. He moved back finally to Edinburgh to Grangemouth in 1983, but he moved south to Leeds in April this year. Well, Detective Superintendent Baines, we do know about Stuart from the film. Now, we have a video fit of him. Could we have another description? Yes, he's about 30 years of age, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8, with either sandy or light-coloured hair, smooth skin, very smartly dressed. Absolutely essential that we trace this man. He may not be connected in any shape or form with the, with the killing, but we need desperately to find him. We do need to eliminate him. And we need to eliminate him as well. Right. Now, the clues themselves. The first clue is the bedspread, which was found in the boot of the car with Sandy's body. What does that tell you? Yes, as a result of uh, some forensic examination by using camera filters, we have, in fact, been able to, or they've been able to bring up uh, a m trademark on there, which indicates, as you can see on the screen, that it was only an actual fact manufactured in 1961 for the British Army by a firm just on the Lancashire Yorkshire border. The other important thing is that this little ticket that we talked about before was stapled to the bedspread. Yes, and the indication so far is that that is probably either a dry cleaning or a laundry ticket. And again, we would ask anybody who's worked in such business for the last 24 or 25 years, if they can identify the format of that ticket, would they get in touch with us as soon as possible? Absolutely, again, essential. Right, now the clothes that Sandy was found in weren't his own. They were too big for him, weren't they? Yes, that's correct. The, the jeans, similar to the ones on the model, uh, were four inches too long for him in the leg. The jumper is about a medium size, but of course the most significant thing is the, the head warmer. It appears like a balaclava, but it is in actual fact an army issue head warmer or cap comforter used by the military for some considerable time. And again, as with using camera filters, we've been able to bring up once more, the date of the manufacture 
Of that, 1952 by a firm called WH White and Sons Limited in Leek in Staffordshire, and we know that that firm manufactured over 300,000 of those head warmers between 1952 and 1956. And you did do something else very important from one mark on it. Yes, we saw there's some some indication of what what appeared to be red ink. Uh, again, this wasn't visible to the naked eye, so we sent that to the laboratory as well for where they were able to use this particular process. You can see some faint traces of red printing on this. It looks as if it might be a number. Uh, I can't see much more under a normal light. I think what we'll try is looking at it under this laser. It produces very, very intense screen light. And we'll just have a look and see what's actually there. Ah, oh, it looks more like a name than a number. I can see the letters K, E, L, L, E, T, T. Yes, it looks like the name Kellett, I think. It's fluorescing quite brightly, certainly much better than we could see it before. Well, that's obviously an exciting new lead. You need to find somebody called Mr Kellett now. Yes, who's written his name on that head warmer, uh, whether he were, at the time whether he had it whilst he was in the, in the army or whether he's had it since then. Absolutely essential. And there could be army connections because of the bedspread and the head warmer. Exactly. It's rather some uh, strange coincidence that we've got two rather dissimilar items in, in the boot of the car. Anybody else that you'd like to speak to? Yes, we are looking at the uh, suggestion that uh, Sandy may well have been involved in some homosexual activity and it would be to that particular area of people who may involve themselves in such activities that we would seek information about Sandy McClellan himself or someone who may have been responsible for his very brutal and vicious death. A uh, 66 year old man who really didn't deserve to die as he did. Mr Baines, thank you very much indeed. And the number to ring if you can help in complete confidence, 01 811 Or if you prefer, ring Leeds Police Direct on Leeds 435353. That's 0532, the code for Leeds 435353.